Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are the rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do, do to others as you would have them do to you. May God add his blessing to the hearing and understanding of his word. Blessed. Okay, let's start there. <clears throat> God has blessed me with family. Family. God has blessed me with a new day. Every day. God has blessed me with my life. Your life. God has blessed me with faith. faith. God has blessed me with health. what? Health. health. Okay. I wish God had blessed me with a little more health, but that's not <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> blessing, one of those weird words that we only use in church or church sort of things. Other than some people say we'll have a blessing before the meal. Now, it's one of those words in scripture that's translated into different words from the Greek or from the Hebrew. One of those is happy. Let me, okay, call out this one and be careful, remember where we are. I would be happy if only I had, what? I'd be happy if only I had six winning numbers. There's an honest woman in our midst. I looked all over the place for somebody to buy me a lottery ticket. Did anybody win last night? Oh, my glory and gracious, me oh my. Lambert, we're going to stop on the way back home. <clears throat> okay, I would be happy if only I had what? World peace. Okay. What did you say out there, Sharon? Did you? Children. Don't have any yet. I would be happy if only I had what? Pokemon, did somebody say? <laughs> no, that's perfectly all right to say that. I had a friend who used to say, when her whole life was formed by tiny Thumbelina dolls, this is back in the early 60s, Maybe you remember tiny Thumbelina dolls. She told her mother, she said, my life would be perfect if I had a tiny Thumbelina doll. She got a tiny Thumbelina doll, and guess what? Her life was not perfect. They lied in that advertisement. So some people translate this word blessing as happy. One of the people who did that was Robert Schuller. Remember the guy with the Crystal Cathedral out in California? He wrote a book called The Be Happy Attitudes, but happiness doesn't quite cut it either, does it? Let me read what we just read with happy in its place. Happy are you who are poor. Happy are you who are hungry. Happy are you who weep. Happy are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, defame you. Rejoice and leap for joy. Woohoo! Happiness doesn't quite cut it either, does it? Now, I have looked at this word in Greek. I don't read Greek, but I read Greek commentaries to figure out what it means. Some of the better interpretations of this word in this context would be unburdened or blessed. Let me try that one for you here. Well, un unburdened are you who are poor. Unburdened are you who are hungry. Unburdened are you who weep. Unburdened are you when people hate you and exclude you and revile you. This doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Fulfilled are you. 
when people revile you? Fulfilled are you when you're hungry? Fulfilled are you when you're hurting? Fulfilled are you when things don't seem to be going your way? It's sort of strange, isn't it? You know why it's strange? It makes absolutely no sense in today's world, does it? To say when, when you're having all these difficulties, when people don't love you, when people exclude you, when people revile you, it means they hate you. People push you to the side when people step all over you, when you're hungry, when you're poor. These are the things that fulfill you as a human being. Doesn't make sense, does it? Jesus sometimes did not make sense in the world's understanding, which is why we have to look with the eyes in our hearts instead of the eyes in our heads sometimes at these very things. <clears throat> so, unburdened. What are we unburdened from? If we're unburdened from our connection to the things that we have, to money and all those other things, and we're unburdened by our sin, we're going to live a different way in the world, which is what Jesus is talking about, living in a different way in the world, a new way in his name. And then we have something very different in this account than we have in Matthew's account. Matthew's Beatitudes come in the fifth chapter of Matthew, which is known as the Sermon on the what in Matthew? The Sermon on the Mount. This is a very different situation because instead of going up the mountain, what they're doing is they're going down into a level place. And who would be there to hear this teaching? There would be a lot of people there, the people who heard that Jesus could heal someone. And if you had a sick child or a sick loved one, or if you were sick yourself in some way that excluded you from people, you couldn't earn a living, you couldn't work, you couldn't do anything, you're going to do anything you can to get better. And that means following this man. You don't know who he is. You don't think he's from God, but you've heard these things about him. You will go there. So there are people who were in the crowd who had sort of an agenda for Jesus something they needed him to fulfill. They might have just been hungry and they wanted something to eat. And they'd heard he'd been able to produce food for folks out of nothing. They were desperate people. Then there were the people who followed him, who were not part of the 12, but that group of people who sort of followed along with the crowd. They wanted to learn from him. They understood sort of who he was. Then you have the apostles, the 12 that he had chosen for his life's work, the ones that he said, you'll do these things and greater before he left them at the end of his life. <clears throat> he is saying to them, I need you to pay attention to this because this is what it's going to look like if you really want to follow me and be my disciple. You're going to have to do these things very differently in the world. didn't make sense to them either, but they thought, okay, here he is. This great mass of people is there listening to this teaching. And it's different teaching, isn't it? Matthew's Gospel said, Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus isn't saying that here, is he? What does he say? Blessed are you when you're hungry, when your stomach is growling from pain of not eating. We're talking about people who ate maybe once or twice a week in this crowd, if they ate that often, because they didn't have anything material to show for life. Blessed are you who are poor, not poor in spirit, but poor. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are you who have hit the end of the road. It's a hard teaching, isn't it? So why do they pick that for All Saints Day in the church? I think it's exactly to remind us what blessing is and what blessing is not. Now, I did read the introduction again to Robert Schuller's Be Happy Attitudes today, not today, this week, in preparing for the sermon this morning. And um, he told a story about a young man who wanted a Ferrari, because that was his tiny Thumbelina doll, was the Ferrari. Anybody feel that way about cars? What is your dream car? If you just had this car, it would be great. My father was the 1965 Mustang. Some people have cars like that, right? You're not going to raise your hand now if you just think I'm going to point at you if you say anything. Paul, what's your dream car? A Plymouth GTX. Well, this guy thought if he had a Ferrari, his life would be perfect, and everything would be great. And you know what? He got a raise at work, and he decided he could afford the down payment on the Ferrari, and he bought the Ferrari. Guess what happened then? Was he happy? Well, when he drove it off the lot, he was. And he got it home and realized what the payments were. He was what we call car poor. He could afford the car and nothing else. He was going to the thrift shop to buy clothes because he couldn't afford anything else. And he found out there were a lot of women who wanted to date a guy with a Ferrari because they thought, oh, if he's got a Ferrari, he's going to take me to fancy places to eat. He couldn't afford the dollar menu at McDonald's because all he did was spend his money on his car. And he realized that there were women who wanted to date the Ferrari, not the guy who owned the Ferrari. 
And then he took it to the dealership because it needed to be fixed, and that's the only place he could fix it. And he found out it costs a lot more to fix a Ferrari than any other kind of car. And he was very unhappy. Um, one of the things that I've read, and if you've had a boat, you may know this. The second happiest day of your life is the day you bought your boat. The happiest day of your life is the day you sold it and got rid of it. <laughs> no? All right, you can disagree with that if you'd like. I've heard the same thing about horses and other things. Now, if we start to measure our life by stuff, we will think, that'll make me happy or that'll make me blessed. We start to thank God for blessings being material things and we forget these other things. So what is Jesus saying to people when he's saying, blessed are you? And then we have another difference in this from Matthew's version. Jesus has woes. Woe. Not like woe is in stop the horse, but woe is me. And that's a word we don't use very often anymore in today's parlance, isn't it? Woe. Now the best... Um, the best definition of what woe means I got from a podcast I listened to on a lectionary, and he said, he would translate it as yikes. 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 Or uh-oh. Uh-oh. Have you ever said that when you do something and you know that things are not going to go well? What's your word for that moment of realization? That Sugar nuggets. Sugar nuggets. Sugar nuggets. What else do you all say when you have that moment of, uh-oh, I've done it now. <laughs> what? Before Isaac, Before Isaac was 18 or after Isaac was 18. You pick. Oh, no. Uh-oh. Now, the title of the sermon is, Is This a Threat or a Promise? Do you think that it means that if you're going to go to heaven, you've got to be poor, you can't have any money? You've got to be miserable. Everybody has to hate you and despise you and want to get rid of you. Those are the people who are going to go to heaven and the rest of us, uh-oh, whoa. Woe is us. We're going to the other place. It's not what it means, really. Because we tend to put everything into the future. Today is about the future, but it's also about the present. The present is if you have Jesus Christ in your life, no matter what you face, whether you break your arm and then get COVID, whether you lose your husband and then have to move, no matter what you face in life, you will never face it alone. You will always have God with you. God will raise you up to new life. God will give you strength. God will give you peace. God will give you hope in that future that we're promised, the inheritance of the saints. What are we called to inherit? We're called to inherit Jesus Christ, our Savior. What are we promised? We're promised the Holy Spirit. We just have to open the eyes of our heart and look around us. So this morning, we're going to recognize our saints. We're going to recognize that in these folks, they've blessed our lives, haven't they? They continue to bless our lives by their example, the teachings that we carry in our hearts, the memories that sustain us, the life that keeps flowing through us to the next generation and the one after that. That's why we're here this morning. We're going to honor these folks who have been a light in our lives. We're going to commit ourselves to living, following the example of those people of faith who have gone on before us. <clears throat> And if we look like they did upon the world with the eyes of our hearts open, we will love our enemies. We'll do good to those who hate us. We'll bless those who curse us. We'll pray for those who abuse us. If anyone strikes us on one cheek, we'll offer the other. If anyone takes away our coat, we'll give them our shirt. Give to everyone who begs from us. And if anyone takes away our goods, we won't ask for them again. We will do to others as we would have them do unto us. It's called the golden rule for a reason. You have to open the eyes of your heart and be able to see the world the way it really is, the way Jesus has it. We're going to say no to the way the world is right now because the world right now is about what we can get, what we can gain, what we can take for ourselves. I was very sad this week to see that Nancy Pelosi's husband was attacked by a man with a hammer and politicians laughed about it. We have to say no to that. We have to say no in the name of Jesus Christ. We're not going to laugh when someone is attacked. We're not going to laugh at that and make a joke of it. We're going to say no in the name of Christ. Even if you didn't vote for her, none of us voted for her. She's in California, but even if you don't like her, to say that it's all right for her husband to be hurt is just wrong. We have to say no to things like that. We have to say no when a Supreme Court justice like Brett Kavanaugh on the other side of the, the political spectrum, when people protest outside his house and threaten his family, we have to say no to that as well because we're supposed to love the people that we disagree with.
us to love them and care for them as dearly as our own selves. God, open the eyes of your heart, folks, or we're never going to get there. But if we do and see the world the way Jesus sees it, we'll start to see ourselves the way Jesus sees us, not as hopeless people, but as people with a future, a future that is going to be realized when he comes again. And I believe he's coming again because he told me he was. That's all I need to know. So as we remember our saints this morning, let us commit ourselves to living better lives. Let us commit ourselves to living more fully as Christ's chosen people in the world so that we can share that we are not threatened by the future or the present. We're promised a hope and a resurrection and new life in Christ's most holy name. I invite you now to stand and sing. We're going to stand on the promises of God as we then go into naming our saints. <laughs>